welcome to the Type 1 Lifting Podcast. Now enjoy the show. All right, guys, I want to tell you a little bit about Type 1 Lifting. So Type 1 Lifting is a clothing brand that proceeds of the shirts, the hats, and everything else go to the Children's Diabetes Foundation. This whole t-shirt company started from me taking care of a five-year-old girl from the emergency department at the Children's Hospital I worked at in Atlanta for a while back. Um, I thought I needed to do a little bit more than kind of just talk about my story. So this is how I started the clothing line because I wanted to show people that even though diabetics have this really bad disease, we can still do amazing things in our life and diabetes won't stop, you know, stop us reaching our goals. So go check out type one lifting.com. And, um, you know, if you have any questions, you can always reach me out on Instagram. It's type one lifting and hope you guys enjoy the show. Hey guys, we have a new sponsor for the type one lifting podcast. The company's called Liberté lifestyle. So, Liberté is a French word meaning freedom, and the company was founded on the desire to have freedom to choose what we want to do with our lives. I actually had the owner, um, Nicole, on my podcast on episode 28, so if you want to go back and listen to her, um, she talks about how she started the company and what she wants to do in the future with the company, which is pretty cool. So uh, They actually have knee sleeves, wrist wraps, shirts, shorts. Uh, love the knee sleeves. I have the ice cream knee sleeves and I love them so much. They haven't, the neoprene's still good. Uh, the seams haven't split compared to other uh, knee sleeves that I've had in the past. Uh, and I'm planning to keep these for a very, very long time. So uh, Nicole actually gave me a promo code for you guys too. So it's all capital letters, T-Y-P-E and the number one. So it's type one. So go to LibertéLifestyle.com, uh, check out what they have in the store, use the promo code TYPE1, and save some coin. Now let's go to the episode. All right, guys. Boom, we're live. Yes, we are live. Welcome to the new episode of the Type 1 Lifting Podcast. Thank you guys for tuning in. Um, I have a very special guest. He is a fellow misfit and also a CrossFit athlete and the head coach of Standard Strength, Mike, the pool boy, Olivas. How you doing? What's up, man? How you doing? Did, did I pronounce it right? You did. You did. Okay, you you said it right. You okay. It right. So, so uh, how did? So, I've been following you for quite a while, and where did the pool boy thing come out? Oh man, so that's a funny story. When I first got into CrossFit, that was around 2012, 2013. So I was like 22, 23 at the time. And I had a summer job as a lifeguard at Raging Waters, which is like um, here in the I, – so I'm in San Jose, and it's actually the largest water park in Northern California. So it's a pretty big, um, cool place to go to in the summer. But from there, I would go straight to my CrossFit gym at the time where I first uh, joined CrossFit. And as soon as I'd walk in, I'd go straight from work to the gym. And, of course, I'd come out and I'd walk in my uniform – and uh, to go and change. And as soon as I'd walk in, my, my friends at the time, they like would tease me and they'd be like assholes. And they would literally point and, and yell out, <laughs> look, everyone, it's pool boy or look, it's pool boy. And it just kind of stuck from there. At first, I hated it. And then I, I kind of just said, fuck it. And I embraced it. Yeah, just everyone just the, cut. Yeah, just roll with the yeah, punches kept, pretty much. They just kept calling me pool boy from there. Yeah. And now what's funny is more people know me as Mike. I mean, know me as pool boy than my actual name. Yeah. So yeah. Do you my, gym, like- my, my gym own, my gym owner hates it too. It's which is funny. So I don't I don't own the gym. I'm just a head coach. But like whenever he goes to like affiliate meetings or whatever or meets people, they'll be like, oh, uh, and he, he says what gym he owns. So he'll be like, yeah, you might know Mike. Mike goes to my gym, and they'll be like, Mike who? And and then he'll be like, Pool Boy, and they'll be like, oh, that's Pool Boy's gym. Yeah. It's pretty funny. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's that's hilarious. That's so funny. Um. So obviously it's getting close to Christmas. Do you finish your Christmas shopping and everything? Uh, you know, I, I, I did actually. Yeah. I didn't buy too much. So I just kind of spend, uh, cause you know, you don't, I don't make too much money as a head coach. Right. So, so I just kind of spend it on a couple just close family members. That's pretty much it. Okay. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm nowhere. I'm always like last minute, dude, like always yeah. last minute. But it do you happens. go online or do you actually do you actually go to the stores? Or do you go I, I I do a little bit of both. Oh yeah, I can't go in the stores. There's no way, man. 
Yeah, no uh, well, I, I have t I have two little kids, so it's a nice little like break away. So it's like it, like I, when I go grocery shopping, like I literally go down like every aisle just to kind of like see what I what I need. Kill time. Yeah, exactly. Just yeah. just for just for a little bit. So, um, but you know, nice. it's, I but it's mostly all like uh, online shopping. So, um, so as I was doing some research on you and. Um, I kind of want to learn about your like childhood and like how you grew up. Like, were you born and raised in California? And like, what what was your? Were you like a pretty active kid growing up? Yeah, so I was born and raised here in in San Jose. Um, and growing up, I I was kind of the tip. I had the typical uh, like fat kid story. I grew up very overweight. Very much loved fast food, and um, at the time when I was young mcdonald's still had their supersized meals and you know the big old gallons of soda and, and shit and i used to love that as a kid and so i grew up pretty overweight and it wasn't until a close uh friend of our families that my my mom had also was working with uh had had gotten his kid into uh little league or pop warner football and wanted to try to convince my mom to allow me to do the same. And she was very hesitant because, you know, football dangerous and stuff, but she knew because I had a pretty heavy or a pretty bad problem with my weight as a kid. I was like six years old and I was already pushing close to like a hundred pounds, wow. okay. um, even a little bit over. Mm -hmm. um, so that was the only reason why she allowed me to get into uh, contact football as a kid. And that is, I mean, I'm super thankful for it. So I ended up, I ended up, yeah, losing a lot of weight because of that eventually. But, uh, yeah, that was pretty much me growing up as a, as a kid. It's how I got into, like, sports. Um, it all started with a pretty heavy weight problem. Yeah. So um, were you – did you play, like, football all through, like, high school? Or, were, like, were you playing other sports like soccer, basketball, baseball, or anything like that? I tried. I tried. Like, I tried to play soccer uh, as a young kid. Wasn't really into it tried baseball and oh my god i hated it so much because it was just i just found it so boring and and not very entertaining or stimulating and i fell in love with football as soon as i got into it i remember how difficult it was because i wasn't active as at all as a kid and i remember it being very difficult and pretty intimidating but I can't quite remember because it was so long ago. I was only six years old at the time, but I fell in love with it. I just fell in love with the camaraderie. Um, and as much as it sucked in terms of like working out or like getting active for the first time, I, I just something about it just made me fall in love with it. And I played, I played through it all the way up and through high school. But I remember some of my most fondest memories um, as a kid was playing pop winter football. I had some pretty awesome memories that I got to share with my parents and, and family. I was pretty blessed. We were, I was part of some pretty good talented teams and we would make it all the way to the national championships, like three years in a row, um, which are held in Orlando, Florida. So mm -hmm. to be able to experience that in like Disney world as a kid and, um, yeah, it was, it was pretty cool. It was pretty cool. Now, but then through high school, through high school, I did get introduced to uh, wrestling, and I played rugby for a bit. Okay, so were you were like when you were playing pop Warner football? So I played pop Warner football too when I was when I was younger. But I'm like a lot older than you are. So, but uh, but like, do they do? Did they still do the weight class and everything like that? And like when you were playing the foot when you were playing uh, pop Warner, were you in a higher <laughs> weight class compared to all your friends at all? Or oh yeah, I was definitely I was definitely the heavy kid. So um. There was a point where I had to move up. Yeah, I forget what like the divisions were. It was like Mighty Mites was the smallest one, and I was only able to to last in that for like my first year because of how heavy I was. I immediately had to move up as a young kid to um, I don't remember what the next division was after that. But yes, I I had a constant weight problem, and I was always um, pushing the threshold of not making weight for the games, but I never, I never not made it. I always ended up making it. And I remember, I remember I'm very thankful for it now, but at the time I, I was very, uh, I'm not hateful, but I, I disliked my father, uh, uh, at growing up as a kid, because I remember he would, he would push me a lot. And, um, 
I would go through the practice and I'd be so tired, right? I just wanted to go home. I wanted to just eat dinner, blah, 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 blah. I probably still had homework that I had to do, Mm -hmm. but he would always make me stay and go to the track because we would always practice at a high school. So he would always make me stay in about another 30 to 45 minutes longer and just go to the track and he'd make me run like miles, like a couple miles. Or be like, we can't leave until you finish a, a mile or something like that. Mm-hmm. And I remember I'd always be so pissed because um, I was just so tired. But um, looking back at it, I think that taught me a lot about um, working hard and, and, and having work ethic in terms of just everything you do in life, whether it be inside the gym or just outside of the gym. So I was super thankful for that. But I remember as a kid, I was like, God, I fucking hate this so much. Yeah. That was kind of like me too. So I I was like teetering on like being overweight because like I was like a taller, taller kid in my, my group. And so they would make me do like, wear like garbage bags and like run like run circles around the track just to like lose a little Jesus. bit of yeah it, it was it was my, no my dad was never my dad was never that bad but yeah yeah but like that's, we, that's pretty gnarly. like right before the game we would actually like i would sweat all the sweat it all out and then kind of like make it make the weight barely oh uh, right? yeah so yeah it's yeah. I, I, yeah. I know i know how it is yeah that was rough that was rough but a bit again some of the greatest memories i've ever had i remember specifically one time the very first year we made it to the national championships we first had to go to to reno and play a team out of i think vallejo and i remember it was like they had to cancel the game right after us because we it was literally about to hit a blizzard storm and it was (laughs) freezing like Mm -hmm. freezing cold and i remember i remember because we had they had that rule where like every every kid had to play a certain amount of plays Mm -hmm. but i remember our coach our coach was getting pissed because we had to um we had to fulfill that rule but a lot of the kids were crying on the sideline because of how cold and miserable it was and they didn't want to go in the game and i remember uh i remember my coach telling me afterwards how like how proud he was of me because of just like, I just stuck it out as much as, as miserable I, as I was. Cause I was a starter. I never, I never left the field. I played both ways and everything. But I remember, I remember that was the one time I wanted to like leave because I was just so miserable out there. I was so wet and cold. I remember specifically, like, I think it was on my left hand. My, my pinky was numb for about two weeks. I'm surprised <laughs> my parents didn't, I'm surprised my parents didn't take me to the doctor or something because that's not normal. No, <laughs> but, no, not at uh, all. But yeah, that, I mean, yeah, those, those were pretty some standout times growing up as a kid. But I feel like it taught me a lot, you know, a lot about mental toughness and just grinding it through. And so I'm super thankful for all those times in my life growing up playing Pop Warner. I learned a lot of hard lessons um, during those times. Yeah, same, same here, same here. So what, what positions did you play? Um, so during my early years when I was a pretty heavy kid, I I obviously played, I think like offensive guard at the Mm -hmm. time, but then there was a point where I hit a little bit of a growth spurt and and I wasn't, I wasn't the heavy, uh, I wasn't fat anymore, but I was still always the, on the heavier side just because of my height, um, at the time. So eventually I would move over to tight end and, um, I played defensive end on the uh, defensive side. Okay. Okay. Same, same yeah. here. So that's, that's what I, I was defensive end, offensive line. Then I, they put me in running back for like a little bit. Cause I was like so fast, but yeah, nice, I, yeah. I, yeah I, I hear you. So, um, when did, when did CrossFit come about for you? Um, so growing up, right. I, I did the sports thing all the way through high school. And then once I graduated, yeah, I did the typical, just globo gym thing, kind of bodybuilding at uh gold's gym at the time now now here they're all american barbell clubs but at the time they were still golds and i always had that um that spot inside you know my heart that was just wasn't wasn't filled anymore i missed i missed being a part of a team i missed being part of like you know camaraderie of sports and it wasn't until one of my high school buddies his dad introduced me into CrossFit. He was going to a gym down in Morgan Hill at the time. I had no idea what CrossFit was, but it sounded intense. And he was like, yeah, it's like this military kind of style uh, workout. Come, come check it out. And I don't know what made me go check it out, but I did. And I fell in love with it right away. It was a gym called Brethren CrossFit. Uh, shout out to Lee Papa's 
owner of the gym, him and I are still pretty, pretty close to this day. And this, and that was like 10 years ago. Um, but that's how I first got introduced to CrossFit. And he was, he blessed me, uh, the, the father who introduced me to it and, and blessed me with my first two memberships. I think he, he paid for out of pocket. Um, at the time I didn't have a job. I was just out of high school. So I wasn't really working and I couldn't afford it. But once those two months were up, I, I couldn't keep going to the gym anymore. So I had another brief period where I wasn't really doing CrossFit. And then I ended up getting a job at a retail store. And funny enough, one of my coworkers in the store, her mom was a trainer at a, at a gym in Campbell here in, in, in California called CrossFit San Jose. And that was when I, I got back into CrossFit. So I started at a gym called Brethren CrossFit. And then I spent another about two three years at another gym called crossfit san jose and that's how i from there i've just been doing it since yeah so when you first went to like the first day at the crossfit gym was it like super intimidating for you and like what made you kind of stick through it to keep on doing crossfit it was definitely it was definitely intimidating but it, it got those like competitive juices flowing in me once again, because, you know, you're in the class atmosphere, you're, you're doing the same workout together, you're pushing and you're always trying to like be a little bit better than the person next to you. And of course I was at the time young and, and, and dumb. So I was like 20, 22 <laughs> at the time. Right. And, yep. and you know how, when you're really, you're really young, you have that kind of arrogance, cockiness coming from, obviously hey, I played football all my life. I want to beat these people next to me. You, you know, once you're, you're, if you're a competitive person, you're a competitive person for life, man. So I remember that, but I do remember hating like, because I was so bulky and from, from bodybuilding, I remember hating snatches. I hated front squats. I hated doing the cleans, um, at that time. So, but, uh, yeah, I, I do remember it kind of being intimidating at first, but I just, it kept me wanting to come back each, each time when I first started. Mm -hmm. So, um, what, what was like the first work? Do you remember the first workout or like, do you remember like one of your favorites that you like early on? I do not remember what my very first workout was, but I do remember, um, Cindy being one of my like earlier workouts. I don't know if it was my first ever workout, but I remember Cindy being one of my first, first workouts and it was pretty, it was pretty brutal. Okay. Okay. It's, cool. like, it's, it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, while, um, while you're like doing CrossFit and stuff like that, what kind of made you go into like coaching? Do you, were like, do we, were one of the owners at the gym, like ask you like, Hey, you know, I think you might be good at this, you know, you give it a try. Like what, what was go what, what was happening that whole process? Yeah. So one of, one of my buddies at the time at my gym, this was when I was in CrossFit San Jose around like 2014, 2015 ish, uh, he randomly asked me if I'd ever be interested in, uh, in coaching. He didn't really give me context. He, he said a friend of his was thinking about opening a gym and uh, needed coaches. And he asked me if I'd be interested in potentially getting my level one and, and, and coaching. And I immediately said, yeah, I, I was super passionate about it at the time. And, and uh, I was really fortunate to be around some really awesome coaches in my uh, first uh, gym and I know that's not always the case for most people who get into CrossFit and then long story short what's funny is the friend he was talking about was himself and uh, he ended up opening up a gym with another partner uh, at the time in, in the downtown San Jose area and that's where I got my first uh, coaching job and I was there for a couple years after that and then yeah I've been doing it ever since Nice. So what, what have you learned throughout your whole process of you coaching? Like, uh, obviously like everyone has like different methods of coaching and stuff like that, but like, what, what is yours? Oh man, I kind of always like to take, um, just little snippets of what I've learned from all my coaches growing up. Um, and I've always tried to kind of make, those methods that they've kind of shared with me and, and, and obviously add my own twist to it. But my big thing is I really like to have my personality show as much as I can in my classes. One of my big things is, is at least what I've learned through, through my times is, is, is being in classes and the coaches that I've surrounded myself with 
I forget where I heard this from, but I think I heard it from a podcast where like at the end of the day, yeah, you're, you're a coach, your, your goal is to teach, you know, your members obviously proper technique and, and put them through, you know, the process. Process. But at the end of the day, you have to remember that I'll, your members are coming in from their own busy, stressful lives. You have no idea what they went through that day, whether it was a good day, a bad day. You don't have any single clue what's happening in their home. Uh, so you have to remember that they're, you're, you yourself as a coach, are there one hour away from their busy, stressful life again? So your goal is to make that one hour their best hour of the day. And, and for me, as, as the head coach of my gym now, I always try to make sure that I remember that and I have that mentality that I am their one hour away from their busy, hectic, stressful life, especially living here in the Silicon Valley, man. We got so many like tech people here. Uh, we have a lot of uh, firefighters in our gym. So I'm always trying to make sure that I'm their one hour of just fun away from their busy, stressful lives. Yeah. One thing, one thing I've learned. So I was a personal trainer for a while before I went into medical recruiting, but, uh, one thing I always, I learned real quick is you never say, I understand because you really don't know like what, what that person's going through, like whatsoever. Not at all. <laughs> it's very true. And I, and I learned, and I learned that pretty hard, um, th this year, not too long ago. Um, I had a, a member, you know, I'm not, I won't say the, the person's name, but I could, I could tell something was off. Um, we were like doing a, a lifting session and, and I, I believe we were testing like a, a one rep uh, lift that day. And, and I could just tell this person was off. And, and I just went up to this person. I was like, Hey, is everything okay? You know, like you, you seem a little off uh, t today. And I was doing this privately. And uh, this person proceeds to tell me that, they just had learned that their, you know, mom passed away um, hours before the class had happened. Actually, mm -hmm. even minutes before the class happened, I think. And and I almost like, even just thinking about it now, I get a little a little emotional because it's just like you just don't know, you know, what a certain person's going through in, in that day, and and that really hit me hit me hard that time. So it it always kind of just makes me, you know remember to not take things for granted and so just always make sure that you are just giving each and every person in your class that one hour of just you know stress-free fun and yeah so you just again you never know what a certain person is experiencing that day that week that month yep yep you know? exactly so in your classes do you are you like kind of like the loud coach or do you like are you the hype man like how how do you like, like what, <laughs> most, what do you do? most people will always say i'm the hype man i have this kind of like thing that i like to do for example where like we have we're, we have a pretty competitive gym um where i'm at and, and what i mean by competitive is like a lot of our members will go out and sign up for like the local comps Mm -hmm. And and they'll go out and do their thing, right? And so I kind of have this running joke now where, like, wherever the competition is, for example, uh, let's say, like, you know, one of the comps that people like to do here are is a comp called, like, the Brethren Throwdown, which is, like, down in the Morgan Hill area. So afterwards, like, that following Monday, if, if one of our members placed, like, fifth at the comp, they'll come in and I'll, like, I'll give them this loud, embarrassing introduction in the gym as they walk in. <laughs> As they walk in, and I'll be like, "Ladies and gentlemen, the fifth fittest in Morgan Hill, such and such," and the, and the whole gym starts clapping and, and 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 screaming, and they get all embarrassed. But yeah, everyone would say I'm I'm a I'm a hype guy over here. I I like to throw the hype on everyone else and 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 keep it as as much off of me as as possible. I hear you. Cool, cool. So, um, how did you become the head coach of uh, Standard Strength um, at that gym? Oh man, so. <sighs> I was at CrossFit San Jose for a bit, got my, my coaching job at, at another gym um, called Third Space. And then um, at that time, there was another gym in the area called CrossFit Moxie, which was looking to bring in uh, some, some athletes to be a part of their, their, their regionals team for the Open. And so I went through there, spent another about three or four years of my life coaching there and competing. And – through different ownership changes, a lot of drama kind of was happening with that gym. And I just, I just wasn't 
wasn't very happy at the time. Uh, the head coach had left uh, for personal reasons that they did not like and get along with. They didn't. They weren't getting along with the owners at the time. Mm-hmm. And uh, when that happened, I kind of thought I would get the uh, head coaching job because I was kind of next in line. I was there the longest, blah, blah, blah. But I didn't. They, they overpassed me for uh, for the owner's like son at the time. By the way, this is – yeah, I got the owner of the gym peeping through. Uh, but, <laughs> but the uh, – yeah. Uh, yeah, so I got passed up by the owner's brother who didn't even live in the state. Uh, so that rubbed me the wrong way. So I eventually, after that, I I wanted to seek out other options. So I was reaching out to other gyms in the area. And and the gym that I'm at now currently was actually happened to be looking for hiring a new head coach. So they brought me along. And and that's kind of how I ended up becoming the head coach of my gym. But funny story, I literally got hired, came over here, coached one day, and then the pandemic hit and we had to shut down. Oh, shit. Really? (laughs) Yeah. So that was that was pretty crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So did you have to do like zoom classes and stuff like that? Were you like supervising those or like, how, how did you, that get, was, you yeah, that was a very difficult time, man. Like we, uh, we tried to do some of the zoom stuff at the time, but it, it just wasn't really quite, quite clicking. Like our members kept saying how much they just miss communal. They wanted to be part of the community again. So we, we, we definitely, tr- uh, provided like at home workouts. And at the time, uh, one of the owners who's no longer here, was really good at putting media out there. So we would film like these really cool uh, workout, like intro, uh, not uh, instructional videos Mm -hmm. to basically post and give out to the members. So we did that for a while, the best we could. And then eventually we, we just said like, F it, we're going to reopen. So we reopened. uh, We were one of the first gyms that reopened against, against the County law. And yeah. So kind of, we just went from there. Yeah. So how did you hide from like the county from like you like having people at your gym? Because obviously like every state had different, you know, regulations and stuff like that. Like I, I'm in Georgia and like literally that was like three, three months at like three or four months after the pandemic hit. They're like, OK, open the gyms back up again. But like how, how did you manage that? Yeah. So here in, in the Bay Area, it was yeah definitely not like that. They were pretty strict and, and it was super frustrating because it's like, uh, you know, there was never any uh, there was never any validation to the rules and, and laws that they were kind of enforcing. And so what we did is we reopened and we in order to avoid avoid getting like in trouble or anything like that, we open for our morning classes and then we kept like the midday pretty pretty much dead and closed because we figured if anyone was going to come visit from the county it would be like in the middle of the day yeah so we would have our five and our six a.m classes and then we wouldn't reopen up again until like five o'clock like in the evening times and what's funny is we got away with it for a while and it wasn't until ran because the coaches we were allowed to come in during the middle of the day and work out still and when that happened we would um we would lock the gym the gym up right and we would just kind of do our thing but it wasn't until i think one of our coaches was was leaving the gym when like literally at that same time uh someone from the county was like walking up and eyeing our our gym to see what was going on and then from there yeah we got busted and we got uh slapped with a fine or whatever something like with a pretty hefty fine and it was pretty stupid man this girl was like on a power trip i remember her saying that we weren't allowed in there blah 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 blah. and we were trying to argue like what do you mean we're not allowed in here you're telling me if we don't want to validate paying our coaches by allowing them to come in and like clean the gym like that's illegal and they were she was trying to say yes that was illegal blah 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 blah. so yeah that was pretty stupid and then really funny story too is i think that year when the open was happening we uh still was doing our friday night lights but again i think gyms weren't really supposed to be open at that time Mm -hmm. and i i remember uh or maybe we were allowed to be open but there were like strict rules about wearing masks and stuff but obviously we didn't we didn't do that uh so I remember we were literally getting ready to launch our first heat 
of a Friday night lights workout. And we had someone knocking on the front door, like knock. And that's very unusual. We, we always have our members go through our back garage door. Mm-hmm. So I remember the owner thinking like, oh, that's someone new. They'll figure it out. They'll come through the garage door. And I'm like, ah, I don't know, man. Something seems wrong because this person's pretty adamant about knocking on our door. And at that time, we had put up a black paper on our windows so no one can see inside. So they couldn't see. <laughs> yeah. So they couldn't see what was happening through the front mm-hmm. door. So eventually the knock stopped, but I had a weird feeling. So I went through the back garage just to check out who it was and it was someone from the county luckily i caught them like down our alleyway before they can see what was in our garage door Mm -hmm. and they were like oh i'm such and such from the county do you work here do you own the gym and i was like oh yes i'm one i'm the head coach here and she was like oh is it okay if i come inside and i and i was like oh um yeah just give me a second go ahead and go back through the front door i run back in the garage i shut the music off i tell everyone put on because we had like a couple boxes of masks so like within <laughs> like five seconds man people are throwing masks on and uh uh luckily the owner stalled a little bit more walked out to talk to her and after about like five ten minutes she came inside to peep to peep in what was going on but at that point everyone was wearing masks and it seemed like we were following the rules but yeah, that was another bullet we dodged, man, big time. That was funny. Yeah, I can't. I can't imagine that being your second second strike and how big that five would probably be. Oh, it would have been stupid, man, stupid. But what's really cool is I don't know if you're familiar with like Diablo CrossFit, but at that time, like they had a really cool thing where the members were um, having like a GoFundMe going because the owner of Diablo, Craig, he was super adamant about like fighting the county because where he was their county was even worse than us they were Mm -hmm. super strict um and he was getting slapped with fine after fine after fine and uh but he wanted to keep his business running you know he had a family to feed and and he knew the importance of, of of keeping his members and his community healthy through the pandemic uh so he was super adamant about keeping it open so his members uh i don't know if he knew about it but they decided to, to go and make a GoFundMe account to just raise money uh, to help pay off these fines. And they ended up raising so much money that they were able to share with the other local CrossFit affiliates in the area uh, that were getting slapped with fines. So shout out to Craig and his community at Diablo, but they were able to pay uh, for a good majority of the fine that we got. So that's awesome. It was super, it was super helpful. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, as you being the head coach, do you do all the programming or, or do you fall like, do you do like the misfit programming? Like how, how does that work for, for the gym that you're at? So we, we actually follow misfits affiliate programming. Um, and obviously as the head coach and someone who's been doing misfit for as long as I have been since around 2018, um, I'm pretty familiar with the programming. Uh, a lot of the times when we have like kind of our off holiday style days where they want, you know, to just program something, uh, for the holiday, I'll take charge of that. Um, I run our gymnastics class that we have here. I, um, so those are kind of like the things that I do as a head coach. Mm-hmm. And then I obviously um, I'm kind of monitoring all the other coaches um, that coach at our, at our gym. But for the most part, in terms of programming for our, our members, we follow the, uh, the, the team misfit affiliate programming. Very cool. Very cool. So yeah. I, I, I know you've been a misfit for a long time. I I've been following misfit. I think roughly around the same time you have, uh, obviously I'm not as talented as you are, but like what, what made you actually go to misfit? Was it, was it like the purple logo and stuff like that compared to like all, <laughs> all the other ones? No. Nah, so the funny story is, and, 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 and I, I listened to your podcast with my, uh, my homie Kelly. Um, we were on a team together, uh, over at, uh, Moxie. And at the time, at the time, Moxie was bought by Diablo. So we were actually part of Diablo CrossFit. We were known as their San Jose location. So they call this Diablo uh, CrossFit Moxie. And uh, going, going into that, I think it was the 2018 season, we, uh, Kelly came in over from a gym called LifeWorks CrossFit uh, and another uh, homie of ours, Troy Stinson, came over to be a part of our team at, at um, Diablo Moxie. So that's how basically I became close with Kelly. 
And uh, we decided going into the season that we were going to need a coach, that we really wanted to take this seriously. So we were looking to hire a coach. And we ended up hiring a gentleman known as Wes Pyatt, who owns uh, Coast Range CrossFit down in Gilroy. He's on the level one seminar staff, mm-hmm. phenomenal dude, super cool dude. And at the time, he was still competing as an athlete. And I remember he had hired uh, one of the original founders of Misfit, who was part of the, the, uh, the, the program at the time, uh, Seth. I believe it was Seth. Seth, who's no longer a part of Misfit. But at the time, he was. And he was Wes's coach. And I remember he was programming for us. And he would kind of filter some of the Misfit workouts um, to us. And after the season had ended – we were kind of in this limbo period and uh, I really liked the misfit workouts that Wes was giving us. So I just decided to hop on the misfit program. And I think once I hopped on, I think Kelly decided to just do it and the rest of our team decided to do it. So we just have been doing misfit since, since then. Okay. Okay. So who's, are you doing just doing the online stuff or do you actually have a coach with them? So now for a while I was doing just their MFT, their, their blog. And mm-hmm. uh, it wasn't until just this past year I decided that, hey, you know, with things becoming as difficult they, as they are competitive wise, you know, the field only gets harder and harder each year. Um, I decided to – because I've never had an individual coach, right? I mean, Wes was, was our coach, but it was a team thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but I never had like a remote one-on-one individual coach so i wanted to try that experience and give it a shot so i applied through misfit and um i ended up was on their waiting list for a while but not too long uh shortly after that um i got an email saying that there was a spot opening and and i ended up now where i'm working with kenzie riley uh who's just an absolute stud she's been to the games herself like three or four five times or something like that uh she's a mom so everyone knows there's no other strength than the strength of a mother so uh, i was i was super stoked to hear that it was kenzie who had the uh opening spot so we've been working together for now uh a little over a year this will be my first um my first full season working with her so i'm super excited going into the open how things are going to go yeah. I, I like, I like Kenzie. Like I actually had her on my podcast, like the first year I did that, I was doing the podcast. So it was like super cool to, you know, talk to her about being a mom and stuff like that. And now she's going to be another, a new, another new mom. She's like a couple yeah, more, yeah. couple more months left till she's uh, has the other one. Yeah. She's getting close. She's getting close, but I've uh, been working with her. has been awesome. We, we met for the first time when I flew out to compete at the fittest on the coast competition in South Carolina, I had qualified for their elite uh, division and uh, she lives just up there, I think in like North Carolina. So it wasn't too far of a trip for her to come down. And uh, so that's when we first met. And that was my first like experience working with a, uh, having a coach there with me for an in-person competition. So that was super, super beneficial. Learned a lot that weekend. And uh, yeah, she's awesome. Yeah. So um, you, you, you said you were uh, on a team for a little while too. So, and now you've gone down into individual and I know, I believe you went to regionals for as a, as a team. Yeah. So I was on that team with Kelly, uh, yeah, and, Kelly 2019, right? 20, 2018 was the 2018, very last sorry. regionals. Yeah. Okay. The very last one, my first and only time ever going. And I was pretty happy to, to go to that very last one, which is arguably the toughest one. That was when they combined the whole freaking Western side of the United States. They went yeah. from like the NorCal, SoCal to then to like the entire state of California to now then bringing in the entire Western side of the United States. So we made it to that West regional in 2018. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what was it like going to regionals and, you know, like seeing the atmosphere of like all these fans, like cheering you on and stuff like that. Like how, how, what was, I, I can't imagine what that was like. Oh, the experience was insane, man. Like I remember just going there the the day prior to register to get like the the number tattoo on the arm, uh, seeing people that I've only ever seen on documentaries and mm-hmm. stuff, such as like Sam Dancer and Cody Anderson, Brent Filkowski was there, Cole Sager, all these dudes. And you're finally just in the backstage warming up next to them. 
it was pretty freaking surreal, man. And uh, it was a, an experience that I'll never forget. I remember um, my parents being there. I remember that was kind of their big first experience um, seeing a CrossFit competition at that level. I mean, they have they had gone to like my competitions prior, but I have never competed at something at that high of a, of a level. So they were pretty blown away by it too. And it was really cool to, to have them get to experience that. And uh, there's so much of that weekend that I remember so vividly. And, and I remember on the very last event, um, our coach, Wes, just telling us to just soak it in and just enjoy that moment. Because, you know, at that time, I had been trying to get to regionals for like four or five years and constantly failed and failed. So being able to get there, I remember after the last event, I kind of like took a knee at the finish line because we actually did really well. I think we finished like second in that of in the in the final event or something like that. And I remember just kind of like getting a little teary eyed and just remembering like God, five years, man, or five or six years trying to fucking get here, and he finally did it. You know, and yeah. at that time we had no idea we had no idea that was going to be the last regional, so it only pumped me up more for the following year. And uh, when they announced that it was, it was, it was, they were getting rid of regionals. It, it made me even more like uh, appreciative at the mm-hmm. opportunity that I had, you know. And we weren't that far from from going to the games, man. I remember we finished, I think, like tenth, tenth or eleventh or something like that. And then in terms of the point difference, if we would have just done a few things differently, we would have had a shot, maybe yeah. going squeezing that top five. Awesome. Awesome. I, I mean, it's always like, it's always crazy to like look back and say like, Oh, I could have done, you know, we've could have done like one more rep here. I could have like stopped and like not taken a longer break here and stuff yeah. like that. Do you, do you always, do you, do you like always think about that? Like once in a while, like, you know, well, I, to, to rewind even a, a little bit first before I get to that, I remember we, we, uh, we barely even qualified, which is funny. It's like when the open ended, we weren't in a qualifying spot. We had to wait for, at the time, they would pull individual scores out of teams for the yep. people who uh, chose to go in Indy. So, I mean, like, to, to go from, like, having to rely on individuals being pulled out to, like, yeah, finishing 11th or 10th or whatever it is that we finished, that was a pretty uh, pretty proud accomplishment for us. But, um, yeah, to answer your question – I try not to think about that too much about like, you know, fighting for certain, you know, dwelling on things that I could have or should have done. And when I, when I compete, I, cause that really doesn't do too much, man, in terms of like, you're only just at that point beating yourself um, over. So I try not to dwell on that too much. Usually I'm, I'm, I've been doing this for so long now where I know how I should do in certain events. Um, I really don't get nervous anymore when I compete. Ironically, I get nervous when I'm about to do an event that I know I should win or do well in, or really well in. Those are yeah. the only times now where I get I get nervous. But yeah. Okay, so out of all the competitions you've done, what what what's been like the best competition that you've actually like like you know been in? That's a tough question, man. I don't think anything will ever top regionals. I haven't quite made it to a semifinal yet. Um, We have a competition here in this area called the NorCal Classic, which is kind of slowly becoming like one of the biggest competitions in this area. Uh, For example, I mean, they give out a $10,000 cash prize to the elite winners and you have to you have to qualify for it, and it's kind of been the thing that our gym looks forward to every year now. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and it's only going to get more competitive this year because now they they moved it out of the uh, game season. It used to be always in June, so sometimes you would see semifinal athletes come. Sometimes you wouldn't because you know they're pre- preparing for the games or preparing for the semis. But now it's only going to get more competitive because they moved it out of the season, and they even moved up the the cash prize at the $25,000 instead of $10,000. So I would say that competition is a, is, has been a pretty well run, pretty awesome uh, competition to be a part of, but I also competed at the granite games um, on a team. And that was a pretty amazing experience. Uh, Man, Wadapalooza. I got an opportunity to compete with on a three person team last year in the RX division for Wadapalooza. 
as, as awesome as that was, I feel like I didn't quite get to experience the full uh, experience of, of Wadapalooza because of the fact that on the last day, uh, there was a, a lightning storm. So mm-hmm. a lot of events had, uh, had to be canceled. And I never got to swim. I never got to swim at Wadapalooza because they thought someone died. In, oh, I remember in, that. In yeah, I remember that. Event. Yeah, yeah. It was nuts. Yeah, I remember we st- we started the event. It opened up with like a certain amount of meters as a team on on the Echo rower, mm-hmm. and then you had to run down to the bank and and and, and jump into the the water and then swim to the next stage and and uh, run on their uh, assault runners, but we finished our row and I remember running down and seeing just a bunch of people just standing. And I'm like, what the hell is going on here? And uh, yeah, they stopped us and they had a bunch of like fire boats out in the water and um, like police and sheriffs were there. And we were like, Holy shit, what the hell is happening? And yeah, <laughs> they told us, they told us that they lost track. I think of a female yep. from one of the previous, previous heats. And they, uh, they thought she had drowned or some shit. But it turned out, I don't know if she never even got in the water or or if she got in the water, immediately panicked and, like, swam out and no one saw her. But um, I think what triggered it is the two, the two females on her team had no idea what was happening. They finished – they ended up finishing their run without her, crossed the finish line and looked and said, where's our third female? And I think the judge at that time was like, your third female, your third female never came out. And so she freaked out and sounded the alarms. And yeah, so that's, that's what happened. Yeah. I, I heard, I heard she just was like, she was ready to go in the water and she's like, forget this. I don't want to go in there. Yeah. Cause there's like too, yeah, many, yeah. too many, too many people in there. So that, that, that's what I heard, but who knows? Um, yeah. But, but, um, so question, um, so I have a question from a friend, Xander Fallick. So he wants to Homer? know. Z- Do Fallon? I know him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know Xander? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I know him. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. I so, yeah. So he he gave me a listener question. So he was wondering, are you planning to go team again this year, or are you looking to do individual? Or what semis? Yes. So um, honestly, probably my best route would would be through the team, but I'm I'm gonna shoot for both. Uh, we have a really competitive gym, as I was, I was saying, and we have a couple athletes, young athletes, um, but they're very, they have a lot of potential, a lot of potential. You know, I've been, I've been doing this for so long and I've, and I've been blessed to, to be able to, again, train with someone like Kelly Clark, who now, right. She fell just fucking one point away. I know it's, a, I hated it. I couldn't, I couldn't point. believe it. Insane. Only two points from, from fourth. So that's mm-hmm. just how close it, it, it really was. So I got to kind of see her growth from from where she started to where she's at now. Um, I was uh, blessed because, like, for example, Danielle Brandon, uh, she's from this area. She actually went to Sac State. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the local comps that I would go to, she would be there before she ever became Daniel Brandon, right? But I would remember I'd see her and I'd just – I remember I'd look and be like, that girl has some fucking potential. Like, she's going to be insane. And then, boom, fast forward to now, she's one of the top athletes – in in the game justin medeiros he's also from this area he's from lodi which is only about an hour and a half from where i'm at now Mm -hmm. i would see him at local comps um i remember specifically he competed at uh brethren throwdown which is down here in morgan hill which is about like 20 30 minutes away from me and i remember no one had a clue who the fuck this kid was but he was just slaying everything and then uh speaking of the norcal classic he competed at the very first one was killing every event. I remember he got the stomach flu on the second day, would go annihilate an event and then go down by the river and throw up. And he was just <laughs> insane. And I remember, at, and this was before he went to the games, and I remember seeing that, and I'm like, that kid is, is fucking insane. He's got potential. He's going to be somewhere. And fast forward now, he's the fucking fittest, two-time fittest man on earth. So I've been pretty fortunate to be around and competing with like, athletes such as that caliber from their beginning stages and seeing what it kind of looks like and and we have athletes to to uh, one specific athlete here um who i see that a lot uh, a lot in and, and and her name is henny henny Bano, Baunick, 
and she's she's probably going to hate me for mentioning her in this, but I see a lot of potential in, in, in an athlete such as herself. She's, for example, in last year's Open, um, you won't meet too many people that are aerobically as fit as this girl is. She would beat, I think she beat in the first Open workout last year, uh, a couple games athletes such as Brooke Wells and Neil Brandon. Uh, so she's got a lot of potential. And we have another couple dudes in our gym who – who's got kind of potential going that way through uh, or that way as well. So it's just about kind of as my, at least my job, I'm kind of taking them under my wing to kind of just like grow them as athletes because they still have a lot of growth, growth to do. And, and we tried to go down the team route last year. And I remember each, each event in the quarterfinal, each of my uh, three teammates had a workout that they did not look forward to. Right. They all had their kind of like, um, weakness workout. So I'm excited to see the growth in, in them this year to see how we do in the quarterfinals. But yeah, obviously for me personally, I'm going to really try to shoot uh, individual. That's the goal, you know, especially working with Kenzie for the first time for a full year. Um, but obviously if, uh, even if I do somehow squeeze in to a semifinal as an individual athlete, I'm still going to help, help the team try to qualify as well. Um, especially just because in general, I'm a, I'm a big community guy, you know, mm. I, I, I love to go out and compete and represent my gym and, and be able to, to see standard strength, which is the name of the affiliate I'm at and see the gym on the leaderboard. Right. And, um, it just brings a lot of pride for, for myself to be able to represent, you know, the people in my gym. And I really want to give them something to be proud of. And, uh, that's a, a big goal of mine is to, is to get a team from this gym out to a semifinal to be able to just see, and represent um, the members in the community. Cause I remember at, at regionals, that was one of the, the biggest things that kind of got me super, super emotional, right? When you're competing, you don't really think of it too much until after when you see on your phone, all the tags that you've gotten from friends of them all in the office of the gym, looking at the TV, you know, they're pausing the nine thirty class because they're, they're watching you, um, you know, during one of the events. And I remember that was, probably one of my most favorite moments uh and that just kind of brought light to me to just remember like always remember like where who you're representing you know you're representing your family out there your community everyone um at the gym the gym owner so that's like my big goal this year is, is try to get a gym or, or a, a team representing at the at a semifinal within the next couple years uh i really want to bring that that pride to the gym as much as i can Chance. That was a long answer for that question. Hey, no, I, hey I'll, I'll take it. I like it. So awesome. So, um, have you been to any of those misfit training camps before? No, I haven't. I know the misfit, um, misfits all the way in Portland, Maine, yeah. uh, not to be confused with Portland, Oregon, but yeah, it's like, and that's like on the other side of the country for me, man. So that's just be a super expensive trip. Um, you know, I don't make too much money. And as anyone who, who is a head coach of a gym or a coach of, of, of any CrossFit affiliate trying to make this like a full-time gig, there's not a lot of money involved. So <laughs> I got to pick and choose what I, where I choose to, to throw my finances and yeah. stuff. So no, I've never been, I've never been able to make it out to um, those, those camps. Unfortunately, yeah. I've, I've always wanted to try to at least go to one camp, but it's like, I, I used to live in Massachusetts and then I moved to Georgia. So it's a little bit harder for me to do the, you know, trip too as well. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, one day, hopefully, I mean, I, I'd love it. I'd love to make it out there. I've met, you know, I, I got to meet like a uh, uh, Sherb and, and and Hunter at last year's Wadapalooza, and they're they're really cool dudes. So I mean, mm -hmm. I'd I'd love to pick their brain more um, at a camp if I'm ever fortunate enough to. Yeah. So um, earlier on, like a couple months ago, I was watching uh, Andrew Hiller's video. Like on oh, YouTube, God. and so all of a sudden, like he he started talking about you, and I was like, "Oh crap!" Like I I I follow this dude. I know who exactly who it is. So <laughs> yeah. um, can can you can you talk about that situation of like reason why he actually was like talking to you, and like what you going back and forth like that whole instance of that video he did. So the reason how that started was um one of my biggest like pet peeves i guess is when like these high level competitions 
have really easy like fuck ups that are like easily fixed and avoidable. Mm-hmm. And I I remember seeing a lot of like crazy times on on the leaderboard of a certain workout for the qualifier that was like toes to bar and deadlifts. And I and I was taking I, I didn't do the individual qualifier this year, but I had an athlete, one of our coaches here, who's a really good friend of mine. He was really trying to shoot and qualify for for the intermediate division. He had went last year and he was trying to go again this year. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was it was only more competitive this year because I think they took away uh, like 10 spots or 20 spots versus last year. And I also remember him saying that like some semifinal individuals were like signing up for intermediate. And that was like pissing me off. Like, wh- why the fuck do people do that? And um, anyways... Long story short, Wada Palooza accidentally posted what videos that they were going to ask for, um, like six hours too early uh, before the deadline. So anyone who had saw seen that would have known that, like, oh, they're going to ask for, oh, they're not asking for workout six. Uh, the workout that had all these like insane, unbelievable scores on. So it just kind of incentivized people to cheat more, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and that's kind of how uh, I ended up sending that to uh, Andrew Hiller, and uh, that's how the dice started, dominoes started to roll um, for that whole situation. So I kind of yeah. pretty much opened that door for for him to just <laughs> ream on Wadapalooza. Yeah, so that's kind of how that happened. Yeah. So when you when you saw like him talking about you on on that YouTube video, were you like, oh crap, this is like so cool, like my name's like getting out there? Well, he kind of already said uh, that he was going to make a video of it, um, so I kind of already expected it to happen. I just <laughs> didn't know that <laughs> how he was going to include me in it. Yeah. Uh, and that yeah. that made me laugh pretty hard. And the amount of like, and I because I didn't tell anyone about it. Like I didn't tell anyone that. Uh, hey, Andrew Hiller is making a video or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so the amount of random text messages from my friends um, that were like, what the? Because they literally would just see Andrew Hiller's video, pop it on their TV to kill time. And then, yep. boom, they hear my they hear my name. And uh, they were like, what the fuck? So it was pretty, <laughs> it was pretty funny the amount of like texts and messages I was getting. Yeah. Did you get a little love on Instagram, too, with a bunch of followers? I did, I did. I got a little little follow boost. So shout out to to Andrew for that. That was that was pretty cool. And yeah. it, it was. I think that was like a couple weeks before I was traveling to Nevada for uh, something called the Mojave Desert Games. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had yeah, I had people uh, come up to me and ask me about the Andrew Hiller stuff. So it was cool. pretty fresh at the time, so that was funny. Yeah. So you you have a you have a pretty decent following on on Instagram. So is I is it because of that first video, uh, first picture you pinned yourself with the speedo? Is that supposed to no, everybody? No, 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 no. Um, <laughs> honestly, I don't. I can't even really point to like how I got a pretty decent following on Instagram. I've been pretty blessed to be able to work with. Uh, certain companies that have mm. like believed in me as an athlete, um, such as like Bear Complex, for example. I work with their supplement line, Complex Nutrition. Uh, I do a lot of uh, uh, video shoots and photo shoots for like uh, RPM, which is a pretty big company in the CrossFit world. So I guess just through various things of working with certain companies and then companies posting me, people kind of like recognize my name. Uh, obviously through misfit and, and such um, and of course I think there'd be like a few there'd be like a few random videos that I would post on my Instagram that would like kind of go viral a little bit where I would get you know kind of boost in following but yeah I don't know it's just been a trickling effect over the last like you know 10 years I've been doing this so I can't really point it to one certain thing I yeah. don't even know why people follow me honestly I just you know it's kind of cool it's kind of humbling uh, I don't really think about it too much, but then it's not until like I go out to these competitions um, where I have people I have no idea who the who the hell they are will come up to me and they'll either talk to me like they know me, and I feel bad because I'm like, 
dude, I don't know who the fuck that just was who I had a full on <laughs> conversation with, but they'll come up to me like they yeah. know me, like, oh, what's up, pool boy? How you doing? Blah, blah, blah. And they'll just ask me about like random shit. And then they'll eventually the conversation ends and I'm like turning to my buddy and I'm like, I have no fucking idea who that was. <laughs> and, uh, or, or I'll have like other people come up to me and say, yeah, say that exact thing. Like, hey, man, I follow you on Instagram, blah, 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 blah. Um, so it's always kind of weird to me when people do that but it, it's kind of humbling at the same time too like hey you know it's kind of cool to think that there are people who actually kind of care about what i do and what i post and stuff so that's kind of cool yeah i i think it's cool i mean i i don't have the bit i don't have the following you do but i i think it's cool to have like at least some people following you and actually respond back to like your comments or dm you just about anything about your posts yeah yeah so it's always kind of cool to to be able to experience that still and uh yeah so all right so uh so we're getting close to the end because i know i know you're outside you're probably freezing a little bit so we'll got some rapid fire Uh, questions shockingly i'm I'm actually good okay i'm I'm actually just trying to find something to plug my phone into yeah so yeah go ahead i'm still listening okay so um out of all of like, you know, obviously like you're in the gym a lot and a good amount of times, what are some things that you do like out of, you know, out of the gym that people don't know about that you like doing? Oh man, out of the gym. So when I was in like high school and stuff, I had a pretty big passion for like, for like music. So I, I was into um, playing like guitar and, and, and bass and stuff. And, and not so much anymore because of just of like how busy I am with like CrossFit and such. But um, mm-hmm. um, that was a big passion of mine. And it still kind of is a big passion of mine. Like I'm a big music lover. Uh, I love music. Uh, I, one of my favorite things to do is like kind of explore and find new artists and such. Um, and I'm also a big fan of like movies. I'm a big movie buff, but um, man, honestly, God, it's crazy. This is going to sound really lame and boring of me, but I don't really do too much outside of the CrossFit world, man, especially since like, you know, I'm a full-time head coach and uh, I also do like nutrition for a lot of clients. I I do remote coaching and I I do have some like one-on-one clients that I'll meet outside of the gym. So I'm constantly always on the go, man. And, And I don't really have too much, uh, downtime for for myself so norm, normally any time that i have to just spend for myself uh it's it's eating and sleeping um so it does take like a damper on my on my social life a little bit but um yeah i make it work somehow still so that's my boring answer for that question hey as long as you have fun that's all that matters right <laughs> that's true that's true yeah um so next question so um, obviously it's like going into 2023 do you have any goals for for 2023 at all it could be either personal or you know crossfit related related or business related oh yeah 2023 man yeah 2022 was a really rough year for me personally so it's just like you know with 2023 i i really just want to put all that all that stuff that has happened in my life and in, in, in this past year behind me and just, just kind of grow from from there and one of the big goals for me that I have um, obviously as a, as a head coach of my affiliate is I, I really want to see this gym grow um, whether in terms of just being membership wise and just the things that we do as a gym uh, personally obviously as a, as a CrossFit athlete you know big goal of mine is to make that that semifinal, whether it be an individual or a team. Um, but overall, man, I just want as a goal personally for me, I haven't really given it too much of a thought yet. Sometimes I forget that the new year is just right around the corner. I know it's crazy. Um, it, it is crazy, man. So, but, but honestly, as, as, as personal as it could be, I, I'm really looking to just find growth for me this year in terms of, of, of going into the new year, just putting, putting 2022 behind and just learning to just take that next step as a person to be, to be better overall and, and just to be as, as a stronger athlete inside and outside of the gym, you know? Okay. All right, cool. So next question, what is your favorite book? Oh man, I was worried you were going to ask me that because I was listening to your, uh, 
podcast with Kelly and you asked her that same question. Honestly, I'm not a big book guy, man. I haven't really read a, a book in a while. The last book that I read was a book called Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker, which mm-hmm. is one of my like one of my passions is just learning about random um, sciencey things and right. and any way that I can maximize my ability as an athlete to recover and, and grow. Uh, so sleep has always been like one of my my passions to learn about. Funny enough, that was the last book I read. Um, but to flip it, a lot of people don't know this about me, but one of my favorite movies, and this is kind of embarrassing to admit is uh titanic so i'll give you my favorite movie and that's titanic okay all right cool um so i know i know you've been on some podcast i, I know you were on the diablo podcast diablo crossfit podcast <laughs> no I, I was never on the diablo uh diablo crossfit podcast but um a while ago i was on a buddy of mine's podcast i don't know if they still make uh any any podcast anymore but it was a podcast called the bro found podcast uh, that was run by a buddy of mine, Daniel, and his uh, close friend, Julian. That was the only podcast I've ever been on. So what, what do you think about podcasts? Oh, man, I love podcasts. That's where I get most of my like random media information from in general. I'm a big sports guy, so I'll listen to like the Rich Eisen podcast a lot. Uh, when I kind of want to get away from like the CrossFit world. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, I'm a huge, huge Joe Rogan fan. I, I, I'm a big Joe Rogan uh, guy. I love listening to his podcast. And uh, if I ever want to laugh, man, I'll always put on the Savon podcast. That guy just <laughs> kills me. Absolutely <laughs> kills me, man. He's yeah. so fucking funny. Yeah. Yeah. Some of the things. Some of the things that I that I that I'm always afraid to say, man. I'll just he he doesn't even hesitate. To no. Yeah. He, he has no, no filter whatsoever. That dude. No. Not at all. No. It's pretty funny. Yeah. Um. Okay. So what? Next question. So what is in your gym bag? My gym bag. Uh, it's pretty. I'm a pretty simple guy. I I rarely ever wear knee sleeves or wrist wraps um god in my gym bag uh shout out to one of my my sponsors i do have some clean freak uh body wipes in there clean freak i do have i think a random pair of like ray-ban knee sleeves that i that i rarely ever use got some some misfit sweat bands for for when i get super super sweaty um Oh, I, I also Airwave. Uh, I I love the Airwave product product. So I, I have two of those in my in my gym bag. Um, but yeah, other, oh, and then obviously the gymnastics grips and stuff. But that's pretty much it. My gym bag's pretty empty. I don't even have lifting shoes in there. I, I rarely ever wear lifting shoes. So okay. yeah, it's a pretty All empty right. gym bag. Just just basic, you know, just being a yeah. just basic person. So um, yeah, I'm pretty basic. So this one's going to be a little personal. So um, it's a little deep, not personal. So let's just say this is your last day on earth. You have all your friends around you. How do you want people to know you as? Oh, man. You ask this, you ask this to every guest, huh? I do, yes. <laughs> yeah, I remember hearing that one from, from the, the Kelly's podcast. But, man, if I were to croak and turn over today, man, honestly, that's such a deep personal question. I, I If I were to what I would want to be remembered by or how I'd want to be remembered is, you know, someone who always tried his best in life, who definitely acknowledged that he has his flaws and imperfections, but always still strive to be as perfect as possible. And that I was a caring person. Um, I always, I always enjoy putting my friends first ahead of ahead of anything that i ever do um and i just hope that you know everyone kind of remembers me as is always the enthusiastic person who just loved uh to enjoy life as, as much as possible and you know i hope i hope my uh, infectious personality you know rubs off on on people throughout their daily lives you know, I guess I guess you can say that's kind of how I want to remember if I ever leave this earth. Hopefully, it won't be for a while. Yeah, not gonna ho- ho- hopefully, hopefully not. So, um, yeah, hopefully not. So, um, where can people reach out to you if they have any questions, like regarding like you know nutritional health, like remote coaching, or just like you know trying to be trying to be another pool boy? Uh, 
Oh man, you can shoot me. Obviously, shoot me through Instagram. Look, uh, look at Pool Boy. Uh, you can shoot me an email. Uh, my first name Mike at standardstrength.com. Uh, literally anything. If you're in this area and you're looking for a really cool community to be a part of, uh, come check out my gym, Standard Strength. We we offer free week trials. Um, if you're looking for some nutritional help, remote coaching, anything, yeah, or just someone to make fun of, just you know, follow <laughs> me on Instagram. Shoot me a message. Yeah. All right. Well, well, listen, thank you very much for doing this. I really do appreciate you taking the time, especially you being outside and like literally you just got finished with coaching and just got on the podcast, which I really do appreciate that. And thank you very much for doing this. Yeah. Yeah. No problem, man. I, I, I enjoyed be, I enjoyed doing this. Uh, I, I love any opportunity, opportunity to be able to just discuss, you know, my passions in life and to be able to talk about like, you know, all the people in my life who have helped get me here. Uh, that's that's something I, I never take advantage of, man. I, I, I've been blessed to be a part of some amazing gyms, being surrounded by some amazing people, amazing athletes. Um, so anytime I get to just have an opportunity to talk about that and express my outlet and passion and where I've come from, um, I'm always down. I'm always down. Awesome. So thank you for having me, man. Yeah.